Uh, so the linear model is, uh, is great. It's widely used, very popular. It has a very uh, elegant theory, um, but it does uh, have its shortcomings. So two things that uh, kind of can be improved upon with the linear model. One is predictive accuracy. The linear model is kind of just a very basic uh, way to approach this stuff so we can usually improve our prediction accuracy by using another method. Another thing is model interpretability. So on one hand, using the linear model is nice because it is interpretable. It's a very just natural and intuitive functional form to use that people can understand. It's not some sort of crazy function that we're using. But at the same time, one of the issues with the linear model is it doesn't automatically do any sort of variable selection for us. We basically just put in predictors and we're going to get these coefficients and it doesn't automatically at the same time necessarily tell us you know, which coefficients we want to use um, and that sort of stuff. So when it comes to prediction accuracy, so we have this new observation, this, uh, this x naught, and we're trying to see uh, you know, how good is our prediction, how good is this um, if we just take this new observation and, and plug it into our, our model. So one common way uh, to look at this is just to look at expected prediction error. Again, this is very consistent with just using the squared error loss function is that now we're just going to look at, on average, how close is our predicted value to the actual value, the y naught. And if you, if you work through this, you can see that this can be decomposed into three different parts. So, uh, so one part is just going to be the variance of our error term. And this is something that we're essentially stuck with. We can't really reduce this, it just has this variance and we just have to cope with it. Uh, so the, what we typically focus on are the other two things, the variance of our prediction and then the bias squared of that prediction, because those are things that we can control. And so the variance of the prediction is really we're just looking at uh, if we have different samples of data, how much is our prediction going to vary from sample to sample, or if we have a data set and say I get 20 new observations and update my model is the prediction going to change a lot or is it going to be roughly the same? Bias is just looking at on average how close is our predicted value to the true underlying value that we are, are dealing with. Um, so to actually um, estimate this, again, we're going to focus on MSC, which is the same as just the variance plus the bias squared. Those are the things that we can control. A common approach to do this is that we, we start out with our data and we're going to randomly divide it into two parts. We're going to have a training set and we're going to have a test set. And the, the training set is where, that's where we're going to train our model. We're actually going to use that to fit our, our model. And then we, we go through and we use the test set to actually calculate this MSE. So, you know, MSE itself is just, you know, the expectation of, of that. And so to actually calculate it, we're just going to go through and find uh, the sample average of that using the test set. The, uh, the main reason for this is that we, you know, we're primarily interested in how well uh, our predictions are for new and future data. It's not, we're not here. Yeah, what's up? Um, on the yeah. File on there, um, so how, how exactly do you come up with that irreducible error variance? That, does that come from the data points or what is that? So this is, um, so you have, we have ways of estimating that. So it's usually denoted by sigma squared. Uh, but I, kind of the key point here is just the fact that you know, yeah, we can estimate it and stuff, but we don't have any sort of control. How we model the data isn't going to necessarily change what that is, so we just kind of have to deal with it. So that's why, yeah, so that's why, uh, you know, these other two terms, those are the things that we can control. So for that reason, we tend to, to focus on that, yeah. Um, and so again, the, the point of using the, kind of the training versus test set and not just working with our actual data set and just sticking to the training set is that what we want to do is we want to, you know, we want to try to find how well is this model going to work for future and new observations. And if we just focus only on the training data, we're going to tend to overfit our data because, again, when we actually are trying to find what our model is, most statistical learning methods kind of use some sort of minimization criteria where you're going to actually uh, try to minimize some sort of loss. And so if we, if we do that, we can maybe fit the data that we have really, really well, but that's not necessarily going to generalize to future data sets because, you know, there's going to be just randomness and noise in the actual data set we have. So to, to take that in consideration, we're going to use this uh, training versus uh, test set approach. And this, uh, 
this really gets at something that's just kind of this uh, kind of this classical problem, classical trade-off in any sort of statistical learning method is that we have this bias variance trade-off. And uh, so down here at the bottom, you can see we're dealing with model complexity. So on the far left, we have a very just simple model. Uh, it's going to tend to have high bias. Its, its estimates are not necessarily close to the actual data points. But the nice thing with that is it has a low, low variance. Because again, the two terms we're dealing with are we have a, the bias term and a variance term. And ideally, we want those to be as small as possible. But uh, we unfortunately have this trade-off where we can't just simultaneously lower them. Usually, if you lower one, it comes at the cost of increasing the other. And so at the other end of the spectrum, we, wanna, we can get some sort of really complex model that fits the data really well. And so it's going to have low bias. But at the same time, its variance is going to be high. And what we ultimately are interested in, essentially, is kind of this sweet spot here in the middle where we can kind of balance those out. And so we end up uh, with a pretty good, uh, pretty good prediction. Um, so when it comes to kind of the shortcoming of using the linear model, if our true underlying function that we're dealing with, if that really is either linear or approximately linear, then our predicted value is going to have low bias, but it could potentially have high variance. It especially is true when we have, if we have correlated predictors, as Justin talked about last time, or if our sample size p is roughly the same size as our, um, or excuse me, if the number of predictors p is roughly the same as our sample size n, or if we're in the high dimensional data setting where p is greater than n, uh, we're going to have issues with uh, the linear model prediction having a lot of variance. And so, um, the idea, again, we have this bias variance trade-off. Linear model has low bias, potentially high variance. So what we want to do is we're going to sacrifice some bias in hopes that we can drastically reduce the variance. And then in total, MSE itself is going gonna, is gonna to decrease. And regularization, as we'll see, allows us to actually kind of fine tune this trade-off and actually try to balance this out a little better. Are there any questions kind of on this first issue with uh, with the linear model? Can you back to the graph real quick? Um, so, I mean, when we're creating the model, mm -hmm. right, we're going to, we want to, you know, we take a, the training sample and then we see how we're doing on the test sample. But in reality, when, you know, our model's in the wild, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, the training and test is only, you know, uh, you're trying to figure out how well your models do, like how well you can expect it to do when you yeah, yeah, yeah. unleash it. But so, how, do, like, how does this? Are you trying to choose the model complexity that will ensure that when you, I don't know, release your model? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that and that's why we use the test set is that that's trying to give us a better idea of because we fit the model on the training data without using the test data. Yeah. That's kind of like our wild data in the yeah. wild data that we then once we fit the model on the training data, then we're going to go through and use the test data. And that's going to give us an idea of okay if we would take this out and actually use this in practice, what kind of error can we expect to see? The whole see? point is I want to find the model, where on the model complexity scale. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we want to balance that out. Um, and that's where you can kind of see, especially with this curve, because the red curve, the test sample, that's really representing, OK, when I release it into the wild, how is it going to perform? Any other questions? <clears throat> Uh, so the other uh, shortcoming of linear regression is that it doesn't automatically tell us which predictors that we're interested in. And often, uh, we're interested in just identifying, OK, out of all of these variables we have, which ones are the, the most relevant, the most important? We usually are just kind of interested in getting this, uh, this big picture idea with our, our variables. And so some things we could do, we could just use some theory, expertise, experience. We could just kind of use some ad hoc trial and error to play around to try to find these predictors. Uh, it's probably better to use some sort of data-driven approach so we're not just um, kind of just coming up for whatever reason. A few ways to do that. So there's best subset selection, forward and backward stepwise regression, uh, also forward stage-wise regression. Those are just different techniques to give us different candidate models to use with different predictors. And then there are various criteria that we can use to actually choose which model, uh, such as, you know, Looking at the test prediction MSE, looking at the CP statistic, AIC, BIC, those sorts of things. 
The problem is that, okay, those data-driven methods are an improvement over linear regression because linear regression by itself doesn't really tell us anything. It's still not necessarily ideal because these methods are unstable and, and highly uh, variable. And that's because they're all discrete processes. Uh, and by that I mean, you know, a predictor is either going to be included in the model or it's going to be excluded completely. And so it, it just kind of turns out that then when we actually use these in practice, that the chosen model that we use can just change drastically from sample to sample. Or even if I, if I have some data and say I get 20 new observations, well, my final model could change drastically just based on those 20 observations. And usually you'd hope that it would kind of be close because there's you know, this underlying true model that we're trying, to, we're trying to estimate. We're hoping that we're going to be close to that. And hopefully a few data points doesn't really throw it off that much. And so regularization, on the other hand, uh, in certain settings is, gonna, is basically going to give us a, a more continuous way to do this. Instead of it being a predictor is either completely in or completely out, we can kind of fine tune it a little, make it kind of a more continuous selection method, and as a result, uh, regularization usually is going to be a, a less variable method.